Welcome to, to my talk, Pass or Not to Pass, Visible and Invisible Benefits of the Serverless Paradigm. My name is Vadim, I'm from Bonn, and generally uh, we do this talk with my colleague, Christian Banes, all the previous versions, currently I'm alone, but he has contributed a lot to this talk. So some words about me. Um, I'm very active in the serverless and Java community, so I'm co-founder of a serverless Bonn and uh, Java Bonn meetup and also expert in AWS. So we will talk about serverless in general, but there will be some specific aspects uh, also um, yeah, for AWS. I'm not the expert in Azure and, and, and Google Cloud, but I think, uh, think many things are uh, similar there. So that's the fifth presentation at FrostCon. For me, and new year, new challenge this time uh, in English for the first time, but I think we'll, I will get it right. So I'm working for the company called IP Labs in Bonn. So we are only several kilometers away from St. Augustine where um, CrossCon usually takes place. And we are we're providing software for, for, for designing and ordering of the photo products like calendar, photo book, print, posters, or everything where you can print your photos. We were founded 2004 and since 12 years I think we are 100% subsidiary of the Fujifilm Europe. So that's probably it for presentation of the company and myself and we can get started and we will start with the value proposition of the serverless. So what is the total cost of ownership of the serverless paradigm? So we will draw the full picture and we will start. First of all, you don't manage infrastructure operation and maintenance. And simply ask yourself, is infrastructure maintenance your core competency or not? If you are the cloud provider like AWS or data center provider, then probably yes. Otherwise, ask yourself, do you want to spend your time and effort uh, for, for the infrastructure operation and maintenance? And probably people know what does it mean in the microservices world and so on. Other thing is also scaling and fault tolerance built in. So the questions you should ask yourself, can you get your capacity planning right if you have huge spikes and so on? Or do you want to solve the hard problem of tolerance by yourself so the design of such a system is shown is, is really a challenge as might is you know so another thing you probably with this serverless paradigm you need fewer engineers but what does it mean so you rely they are heavily on the managed services and that's why you simply you can tie things together glue them together so you need fewer engineers to start implementing and start validating your idea and probably you can do more with the same amount of people. So it's probably the core message. You can do more with the same people if you focus on, 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 on the right things. And uh, also you will have less code written. Probably the same reason relying on the managed services. But I really like this quote uh, from Paul Johnson, who is very active in the serverless community. Whatever code you write today, it's always tomorrow technical debt. So or another quote, the best quote is no quote written at all, but also uh, think of uh, configuration as also a quote because yeah, you have default values, you have to change values and, uh, and that's also part of the quote. And less quote also mean low technical debt. So you don't, you don't know own too much quote and time and effort required for maintaining your solution over the whole life cycle will be much more than developing it. So probably 75% of, of, of the time we spend maintaining the solution which we have developed uh, some time ago. And it's really huge time and effort because we think of, of our software as a product, not the project like done and finished. And that's why it's uh, it's really a huge game. So try to minimize the code written. It will save you time in the future. And also it's about focusing on the business value and innovation because you free your time for doing things which matter for your company and probably every organization wants exactly this. Be innovative, deliver business value and so on. And probably as a result, you have faster time to market because you it's currently key differentiator in, in the today's business. And also ask yourself, what is core for your business and what you can get as a commodity or utility or software as a service. We'll talk also about this um, in the next slides. 
So fast or not too fast, it's also the question and there is no silver bullet uh, for all those things. And what I did, uh, I have prepared some kind, some kind of decision checklist for you to decide to go with serverless or not. There are a lot of um, components which can influence your decision and many of them are specific to, the, to your company, which I don't know, but we will go through some, some, some major uh, factors which can contribute to your decision. So the, the first thing is application lifecycle. And what you have to understand is probably many applications are in one of the two phases, explore and exploit. And explore phase, it's where you validate your hypothesis quickly. You want to experiment rapidly and you want to run your experiments as cheaply as possible. And serverless is a perfect fit for that. You don't have to purchase the infrastructure. You don't have to do commitments for one or three years. And you also probably don't have too many users. So serverless is simply the cheapest way you can throw things out or re-architect your application. It's some kind of dream greenfield world and it's really a perfect fit. But of course, if you have built something which already provides um, customer value, the next step is to, to scale, yeah? to, build this, to build this on scale and to build a profitable product around this. And uh, probably there is no right or wrong answer if the serverless is the right paradigm, but you will probably uh, do partially serverless and partially not serverless architectures there. And the things you have to ask yourself is how much of the stack do you want to own on your side to, to deliver the business value? And also, what do you want to, to outsource? And by outsourcing, I also mean service level agreements, regulatory compliance, price roadmap to your service provider. And it's also very difficult to say what's the right thing to do because you can get the really good product as software as a service, but you don't control their roadmap. So if you are the small company, you rely on your on your provider to, to deliver the features you may want, and it can become quite challenging to wait. So sometimes you have to decide, okay, I don't want to own some component, but it's not my core competency, but I want to be faster there. I want to fulfill the needs of my business and I don't want to wait. So. Ask yourself, what do you want to own? What do you want to outsource? Where you should spend your time, effort, and focus? And also, yeah, of course, we are in the world where we have existing application, and you can't magically move all them to, 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 to your service provider, to cloud, cloud provider, especially for serverless, because it requires the architecture. And, but you can try to modernize part of them. And uh, probably many of you know that some kind of strangler pattern, which was coined by Martin Fowler probably 16, 17 years ago, that you can, you, you see that you, are, you can scale with the application, delivering features become, becomes uh, painful. You can scale your organization and, and so on. So you try to put some proxy in front of, 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 the, yeah, of, of the old application and try to, delegate new features through this proxy and, and implementing some kind of other architectural paradigm and in the serverless world you can use api gateway to yeah to rely on new architectures and also application load balancer currently allows you to to call lambdas yeah in the serverless world and and try to do things differently from some points uh, from from some starting point it's in the serverless world, it's also the FinDev concept because what serverless allows you is to figure out how much the feature costs you and also in, in terms of, of spending in the cloud for all your services, but you can also measure the business value. So I offer this feature as a premium feature and how much do I earn with this feature? And so I can um, compare the things and decide probably not to offer something or not to invest my time and effort. And there are really big software as a service tools like Lumiga who provides uh, who provide this detailed view on, 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 on the spending in the serverless architecture on their per feature base. And, and it's also one of the decision points because you can do pricing uh, on yeah so value-based pricing. So depending on the usage, not on the subscription model. So this is a huge uh, opportunity in the serverless world to uh, to do yeah, to pay as you go model for the birth side 
the both sides, so there's the service and the, 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 the customers. And other things, and it will be a bit more technical, so you have to understand your workloads. And by understanding your workloads, I mean the architecture and the style of your application and so on. And probably event-driven architecture is the perfect fit for the serverless because many things are like events there you react on and play some business logic, and uh, it's really a perfect fit. The same is probably true for API-driven RESTful application because you can provide uh, put API gateway and in front of this and do all kinds of things. The same is probably too with the web socket. It can become expensive with the API gateway with the, with the price model. So you have to look if you have millions requests per, per hour, it can become really um, pricey, but generally from the architectural point of view, it's a good fit. Another thing is a bad job, some kind of a synchronous job, which uh, will be triggered in some specific point in time. And I think it's also a good um, fit. At Epilabs, we had a lot of batch application and batch jobs like, like payment capturing, like email, like, like deleting the, the safe project because, because currently there are some days spent and uh, the customer have also purchased, so we have to delete them. And initially we packaged them in one application so all the bad jobs and had the issues that most of the jobs had to run at, at, at the midnight. And there is a danger that you run into the scaling issues. Uh, even somebody has the job which runs at two o'clock in the night and then changes it to, to run also the midnight. So probably the capacity sitting there won't be able to execute all those jobs in parallel. And if you do serverless, Application you can scale all those jobs individually so they don't interfere and so on. That's it's a really huge um, advantage. Also, the internal tool the same thing. The internal tool doesn't require to run yeah 24/7, and so the serverless with the price model is is really a perfect fit for them. Um, but also there are other machine learning, artificial intelligence, big data, and so on. And um, I see many use cases coming but in general it, I, I can say that it's currently the way to go but LWS releases currently frozen again you will see my presentation okay yes we can yes. still uh, see the last slide the last slide it's became frozen again so i have some kind to go out and okay now do you see or do you don't, don't see anything no, you there? need to restart the screen sharing okay that's the same situation that we had that it became it became frozen and i have to restart probably it will be the issue screen share is starting yeah we can see the slide now okay so we try to go forward and see, and then I will probably start again. So for machine learning and, 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 and artificial intelligence, AWS released Lambda layers where you can provide your own runtime, and here there you can pack your favorite machine learning tools like TensorFlow and so on. So with these features, it became um, available. Also, recently, AWS uh, provided the possibility to share the Elastic file system, like the storage, the filer uh, to the Lambda. And so you also can install um, your machine learning tools or programs, which, is, which isn't possible in S3 because it's some kind of a bucket. So you can't run the programs there. So uh, AWS um, recognized that there is a lot of space to improve and they release uh, the features which uh, will enable all these use cases in the future, probably, or many of them. But you also have to understand, do you need some kind of specialized hardware? Yeah, for example, do you need GPU access required? And uh, currently Lambda doesn't support G GPU hardware, but it's probably not, not the use case because um, GPU is not very quick and Lambda is for low latency applications. So it's probably even not your use case. Also, if you um, write Lambdas as function as a service, you choose the um, memory and the CPU will be given proportional to the memory. But sometimes you have the application which doesn't, which don't need 
um, this RAM, RAM to CPU ratio, you need more RAM and, and low CPU and, and so on, and it can become pricey if you use serverless. So try to think, is the CPU bound, is this RAM bound, is this uh, network bound, and so on. And also, do you need constant, constantly high performance? Because sometimes you have applications where you have uh, response time below 100 milliseconds, like bidding and gaming platforms, and you can run into issues with serverless because of cold starts or because of a bit more latency if you glue services together, like API Gateway, DynamoDB, or you have to think asynchro heavily asynchronously uh, to make this possible. So that's probably not very good fit if you really need constantly, constantly high performance. Also, the question you have to ask yourself, do you need high throughput? Because Lambda network bandwidth is really limited and it's order of magnitude lower than a single modern uh, SSD. And it's shared between all functions packed on the same VM. So the throughput on, uh, will be too, too high and can also limit you. Another thing uh, also, do your function need to communicate with each other or do you want to decouple with them with the queue or API? But the functions are not directly network accessible in general. So they must communicate via some intermediary service there you have to serialize and then deserialize things. So it costs time, it costs uh, throughput. So generally, also the, the thing you, you have to think of. So another area that you, that you have to understand is platform limitations. And you will go through LWS uh, examples. And the one thing that everybody mentions is the cold start. And then you have the situation, the cold start with virtual private network and, and also without. Um, so generally speaking, you will have all this cold starts if, um, if your container was released and then your function runs so the, for the first time or for the first time you have the huge peak with, with many functions called in parallel, like newsletter was sent and there are no free containers that have to be started, then you will have some kind of, 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 of cold start there. The things that have to be initialized. Also, your execution environment has to be initialized, so you, you will experience some penalty. And for those use cases, in general, C Sharp and Java as a language suffer from this because they generally start slowly. AWS released a provision concurrency. They you have, then you can yeah, reserve capacity, which will stay. Of course, you have to pay for the um, capacity, but for use cases, if you know I have to send, uh, to, to send the newsletter out, and probably many people will, will click on this at 9 o'clock and so on, sometimes better to resolve capacity or not, not, not to run into, into the issues. But also for languages like Java, there are also some other strategies to deal with this. People who know GraalVM see that there is a substrate VM with a head of time compiler which provides native image and this native image uh, enables uh, uh, quicker time and also low memory footprint. And there are a lot of frameworks in the Java space like Micronaut, Quarkus, or Spring Boot, which, which offer support for GraalVM and native image. And that may be the way to go because Java and serverless were, yeah, were not really friends, uh, thread, friends until now, but uh, of course, people are working on this as Java is still one of the most popular programming languages. Also, the situation with Lambda and VPC, and sometimes you are forced to put Lambda and VPC depending on the services you use. For example, if you use relational database service or you use, you use Elastic Cache and so on, then these services require to be behind the virtual private network. And in order for Lambda to communicate with this, you also have to put Lambda behind the VPC. And the way, and the way it worked previously, it's so that uh, if, you, if your execution environment scales, so you, you need more Lambdas run in parallel, the more network interfaces were created and attached to Lambda. And uh, the number of these interfaces was the, the amount of concurrency, how much, how many functions can run in parallel. That was the fact of this. And it caused many issues um, in LWS, you had to manage the IP address space on your own. You, had, you could reach a count level network interface limit, and you also 
could uh, hit the AI rate, uh, rate limit on creating new network interfaces. And in that case, you experienced the error and you couldn't do anything about it um, besides uh, to retry. And also Lambda behind the VPC, it could, yeah, in the case of Pulsar, it added up to 10 seconds to the execution uh, time and it became really impossible to, to, to use Lambda with the relational database and so on because of all these issues. And last year, um, LWS released um, the update. So uh, the network interface will only be created when Lambda is created. So when you first time create or update Lambda or a VPC setting, then this uh, network interface will be created and it reduces uh, the call start really massively from 10 seconds to behind uh, one second. And this uh, this improvement is all there in all the regions and all the availability zones. So it's currently, yeah, it's currently possible to use Lambda with, with, with the uh, services behind virtual private network. And also you have the choice when you use database. Yeah, most relational database you have to put behind virtual private network. There is another possibility uh, to use Aurora serverless, AWS native relational database, but you don't, uh, but you use this in the way like not managing the connection pool, but using this uh, via um, HTTP DynamoDB. And there is the option data API, which enables you to, to use this like, and the connection will be managed uh, for you. And it's still in beta, even one year later, it's still in beta for Postgres, but it, it will in you uh, other use cases. Still, there is a, a lot of uh, latency are high and, um, and it's current, that's why it's probably there. But generally, don't be scared of the cold starts because you, you have them also in the container world. So if you need, I use Docker, Kubernetes as a orchestration tool, doesn't matter. Uh, probably if you require another server or another yeah, an, another instance, then it all takes up to 30 seconds or even minutes to start this instance. So you have even huger, uh, bigger um, cold start and the way to avoid it, you scale earlier. Yeah, so if you see CPU is at 40% then I scale up. And that way you overpay or over provision. So it's probably sometimes can become really, really pricey. So you have all these issues also in the in the container world and, and scaling by function is simple. You, you think differently when you do this. But generally cold start, yeah, it could be an issue, but don't really, but it doesn't really matter if you make the call asynchronously. So it, for, for the for many use cases, it's not even the issue. And even one second uh, added in case of call start, it's also not the issue because uh, LWS saves the containers for the long time. They don't release the exact numbers, but but probably one hour is is a good fit. So one user will experience uh, call start after one hour. It's it's not really a huge uh, deal, I think. Or you can use resolved uh, provision concurrency. So other platform limitation, um, ma maximal duration time for Lambda is currently 15 minutes. It was tripled on, uh, one and a half year ago. Another thing is the API gateway. If you call Lambda behind the API gateway, API gateway has the timeout maximal value of 29 seconds. So if your Lambda takes more than this, then you will receive the timeout. So Maybe the issue, but probably if you use microservices, you want to respond quickly, even then 29 seconds, probably three seconds is also too much. So uh, you have to think asynchronously in the cases if you have some some Lambda, which, which uh, executes more than half a minute. Also, you can only assign three gigabytes of memory. It was also doubled uh, one and a half year ago. I think it's okay. Probably you cannot do some image uh, transformation with Java with three gigabytes of memory. Uh, so there are some limitations you have to think about and it probably will also be increased uh, sometimes later. Other limits, so max concurrent invocation, you have the account wide limit, how many, many lambdas can run in parallel. And it depends on the, on the region between 503,000 
parallel executions. You, this is the soft limit. You can increase this limit if you if you request this. The problem with this is um, every it, it doesn't scale if you don't if you want ten thousand instead instead of three thousand. It won't scale automatically. So I think five hundred additional parallel execution per minute after this soft minute is currently the, the, the way to go, but it's still possible to increase. Also, there is collection, uh, connection limit. So if you use Lambda with a relational database, uh, the situation is you may run out of connections uh, within your relational database. If you have too many Lambdas running in parallel, parallel accessing the same database, and probably, as you know, the, the the number of connections for the database is a factor of the, of, the, of the size of your database. So if you have M5 large database, you will have the amount of connection X. If you have X large, it will be the double of this and so on. So you may run into these issues and then you have to think, probably I have to use data API for, to avoid, avoid managing connection my own or even no SQL database, so like DynamoDB and so on. They are really much better fit for the serverless world as, as relational databases, but people still stick with the relational database because they are familiar with uh, SQL. And so also there are also reasons for this. Another area is also cost at scale. You also have to understand your bill. And if you if you see the bill and you see the Lambda costs are really only small fraction, this is the, the screenshot of one of our serverless applications, you see the total cost of uh, $30 and Lambda cost is only 25 cents. So uh, we'll go for other services, but Lambda as a compute, it's only a small fraction of this. And there are other things which add to the costs, like API Gateway, it costs you $3.5 per million API calls. It sounds like adds not too much million calls, but if you have uh, many services which experience million of calls um, in one hour, it can become pricey. That's why AWS released recently some kind of alternative to API gateway. It's called HTTP APIs. It's still in beta, but um, I think it will go general and uh, available. It will become general and available, and it's seventy percent cheaper as a as API gateway. Currently, it has fewer configuration options, but for the most use cases, it's it's good enough, and it will. It, it's even uh, I think it's even faster as an API gateway. So it's probably the way to go for the future. But the, currently, it's, there is no feature parity to API gateway, which was released I think five years ago. But it will also enable some other cheaper use cases, so the people will rely heavily on kind of API APIs and API gateway. Also, you have to think about DynamoDB options. Default option was provisioned, then you have to think about your reads and writes and so on, how I can provision them, how I can scale them. And that's yeah, DynamoDB didn't feel like feel like like serverless because you, you have to manage all those things. And they added the option on demand scaling, then they will scale for you. But of course, it also adds up your costs. So if you have high utilization, you will pay the 7x amount for, yeah, for, for on demand scaling. But also think of your application. Does it run at high scale all the time? Probably not. So it's probably a good decision to go with the provision concurrency probably pay a bit more for this, but don't worry about how to provision uh, capacity anyway. Also, there are another thing which add up to the bill, like logging costs can be really huge if you save your logs and, and don't delete them because you pay not only for, for logs in the flight, but also for the storage. Also, monitoring costs, CloudWatch is it's really expensive service, so also think uh, how many metrics do we want uh, to track and so on because the price can depend also on this. There are also data transfer costs um, if you send your data out. And uh, it's really, really complex thing uh, to understand all this between availability costs, also between region costs, really, really very uh, complex thing. X-ray for observability, 
adds up to the cost. One of the most ex uh, expensive courses are their step functions because you pay, I think, $25 for million transitions, and that's the, the service for your orchestration and so on. Also, you, if you enable caching in the API gateway and also DynamoDB cache, you have uh, then, then services which run all the time. It won't be serverless anymore because you rely on Elasticsearch and other things behind. It adds up to the bill. Also, you have remote API calls. So the Lambda is sitting and waiting for response. And uh, if you don't have timeouts, it's, uh, of course, also one of the areas. And you also have third-party services which you use for observability and so on. There you see that the cloud watch is not enough for this. We will also talk about this. They are really pricey services, but they add also value uh, for you. So another topic, the last, uh, the, the next one, organizational knowledge, and it's probably one of the most sensitive um, topics in the serverless world because you have to ask yourself, do you have already have DevOps knowledge in the organization, and if it's so, how it, yeah, how it fits together, and yeah, it's really if you have classic system administrators, and then um, probably they won't be happy. If you go serverless because they ask uh, what what can i do in this world and i really love and can yeah it's really good talk from tom mclaughlin what do we do when the server goes away and uh, he explains where the classic administrators working in the in the in the team yeah in the team not the coupled in the, in the some kind of development agile team scrum team where can take the charge and there is a lot of also there are a lot, a lot of challenges in, in, in the serverless world, like monitoring, alerting for the whole application, and probably not every application is 100% serverless. Also, chaos engineering becomes more important, and organizing so, uh, game days is one of the things. So to 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 to, to see if your system is fault tolerant, so how you react on the on the on, on the failures from the cloud provider and so on. This is the area where system administrator can shine and help. Also, infrastructure as code, automating everything and testing of infrastructure as a code because the provider release new features, they rename things. So, infrastructure as a code can become broken very soon. And you have to test also this thing. And um, another huge area there they can contribute is help understand constraints of LWS services and choose the right one because each service has a lot of constraints. And this is only one example for event source. Uh, what do you choose? Kinesis stream, SNS, SQS, even event breach, or even combination of those services. And they all have their usages, your use cases, and even constraints. And I think that system administrator, they understand all those constraints even better as developers. They are very sensible, it's sensitive to them. So they can really some kind of consult uh, and, and, and help understand what's the right use case for the right scaling. For now, they may experience issues and then probably have to, to evolve our architecture and so on. Um, so they also have uh, different uh, pricing models and so on. Oh, this is only one example of event sources. So um, I think that's... Uh, a really good fit the system administrator can help and this is the really huge area so another thing is of course uh, are developers willing to learn new languages if you have people which only program java or c sharp as i told you that yeah there are there are things which are already improved for those languages but generally you prefer something like node.js probably you have go people but you have to have some kind of organization culture of their only developers. The developers also want to learn new things, want to take another responsibilities also in the operational area, working tightly with system administrators. So this all this kind of political things and cultural things you have to have in the consideration. We are currently we have six teams at IP Labs, approximately 30 developers and uh, this currently the, the, the second team which um, develops completely serverless and uh, this team was founded three months ago with system administrators, previous system administrators there and currently they have found their role and, and 
I, I think, yeah, with the right culture, with the right, um, yeah, with, with the right motivation, so you can also convince system administrator to to go to the Scrum teams, developer teams, and contribute there. And probably the last thing that really deserves the whole talk: platform maturity and tooling. And uh, in AWS world, you have infrastructure as code solution. You have cloud formation. You recently have um, CDK and Terraform. Terraform is probably not the best thing for serverless, but also you have you have to understand what you choose for infrastructure as a code. Also, you have different development environments or even frameworks like LWS SAM, Amplify with strengths and weaknesses, and also third-party serverless framework. So you also have to understand what tool do I choose. If you have only several teams, it's probably better than the other teams um, choose the same tool. So you have some kind of organizational knowledge, shared knowledge, not that every team tries uh, different things, may, maybe also working for you. And also you have to ask yourself, CI, CD, all this um, code commit like Git as a service. Not many people use this because it doesn't have feature parity to Bitbucket, to GitHub and so on. So ask yourself, do you want to try this out or do you need more mature solution? Logic, log aggregation, the same thing. CloudWatch is perfect for serverless application, but if you have EC2 instances, then because of one minute resolution of the metrics, it may be not the best fit. And you have to ask yourself if you have the application with partial serverless and partial not serverless, what's the best strategy? Monitoring, tracing, alerting, it's a huge area where CloudWatch offers only basic services. And you have um, tools like Lumigo, like IOPipe, like Epsagon, which provide observability as a service with really good tracing and alerting, but they're really, really pricey. So, but I see that the CloudWatch has been improved since, yeah, yeah since last year. So also AWS uh, releases, um, uh, features there and also the security um, and so on so ask yourself if if serverless security is the huge new area because there are events it's not http traffic and uh, there are a lot of uh, different areas how to defend all those applications also now you have integrations with the third party services aws released event bridge which allows you to connect to the services like pager duty data docs then desk and so on without using of web hooks. So also a new area how you can um, integrate serverless services with the third party services outside of LWS world. And also another area is local testing and debugging. It's really difficult to do locally with, um, with serverless and because, uh, yeah, because I am permissions and so on, they are re really difficult to replicate. Locally, you can do some things with DynamoDB, with Lambda API Gateway, there are Docker images for doing this, but probably uh, you and also tools uh, and also software as a service companies, which, which uh, like Stakery, they do this, but generally speaking, you will try to what local testing of the, with LWS, you can have um, your developers or even teams can have multiple the staging accounts and test accounts and do things there or even do things in production. So this is probably some kind of decision checklist as you see a lot of things to ask yourself, but everything is a trade-off. So there is no right and wrong. So that's why you, yeah, you, you have to be aware of many different things. So some words about the future of service, uh, serverless, where it might be going. And I really like this quote from Simon Wardley, who is really known in the serverless community, where he was asked, is serverless is really a niche? Oh, and he asks, yeah, that might be true if the niche is called the future. So he says serverless is, is the future. And um, his, uh, Simon is also known for the Wardley map. Probably don't have too much time to explain this, but he says that everything evolves from genesis on the left side to commodity on the right side and now lambda like execution environment as a service it is evolved uh, and and it's in the commodities state so every everybody can use this 
but what he also tells us that in order to use some new paradigm, and serverless is a new paradigm, you have also to consider so-called core evolution of praxis. So you can do new things with the old approaches, like you won't probably program NoSQL um, for new SQL, no NoSQL database with the knowledge of relational databases. It, it, it simply fails. So what are co-evolution of practices in the serverless world? As already mentioned, you will have two DevOps. There is a link below to the DevOps topologies where they explain their right and wrong <laughs> DevOps topologies, so failure that people do. And uh, probably the right topology in the serverless world is the dev and all ops are really interchangeable. They are working together, they are, sh they are sharing their responsibilities. Okay, now it's frozen again. So I probably have to go out. So, oh, now it's well. So you also have thin depth for. The screen is not shared. I'm checking. Oh, the screen is shared. We can see. You can see. So, so far. okay. FinDev responsibilities of financial responsibilities all, all also go to the team because they can see the, the invoice. They can improve this. They know uh, they know the pricing of the services and so on. So they can set up billing alarms and so on. This is some kind of shifts. It's, not very easy currently for the devs. They have to, to be sec and, and ops and also financial responsibilities and also security. This uh, kind of cross-functional collaboration, it, it sounds easy, but it's really, really difficult. How many things do the developers uh, have to know and have to learn? You have also completely reliant infrastructure automation, so everything should be automated. Otherwise, you'll probably lose the track. Chaos engineering is also called co evolution of practices. It's really, it's really must have in the serverless, probably also, but also in the microservices world. Each developer may have its own LWS test staging account, as already mentioned. It's simply that cheap with serverless because you only pay as you go for the serverless. You don't use them too much. You only pay for the storage, but you don't have to. Too much storage, too much, too much storage capacity in your test environment. So every team can get staging and test, and every developer, if everything is automated, can set up a new environment very quickly. It's probably a matter of 10 minutes maximum, depending on the number of resources and so on. Also, as already mentioned, no local testing environment because you don't have all this, all this. Uh, restriction that you have how much puts and gets on three s3 bucket and so on how many concurrent invocations you don't have all this thing locally so you don't can't run all the tests locally it doesn't make any sense really so you you have to work in the um, in the live environment and also testing in production become becomes really important because sometimes you, you can't use staging for tests because you don't have enough traffic you don't have enough storage so um, you can't rely on, on, on the test, on the, uh, on the staging, and you have to test in production. They have to, to think carefully how to do this with feature toggles and so on. There are a lot of strategies how to do this, which, is, which are beyond the scope. Also, type integration, the third party I mentioned with event breach, with, with, uh, you can integrate with PagerDuty, even Shopify currently. So there are a lot of custom integrations which uh, become available each month in LWS. So the last year, the Berkeley view on the serverless computing was released and also interesting read. And they say we predict that the serverless use will skyrocket. So that's the same thing which uh, Simon Wardley says, but also they see challenges and these challenges we have already discussed, the limitation of the serverless and probably the challenges are inherited from them. So provide low latency and high IOPS ephemeral storage it's currently not possible uh, to do also one thing which was mentioned provides serverless durable storage which was sold which has been solved with the possibility to attach a, a elastic file system to the lambda so one thing is, is also uh, is, is currently solved this networking performance um has to be solved that lambda which communicates lambda can communicate quickly and there are also challenges with uh, 
some security issues. So you can define fine-grained security for your lambdas, but sometimes you want to define some security policies and then interpret them for, for other um, functions of the service for lambda. And it's currently not possible. You have to write your own, uh, each time your own um, permissions and so on. So there are things which uh, which have to be considered, but general security is, is much better in, in, the, in the serverless world than outside. And also accommodate cost performance. So what we will see that the hardware will be released, which really tuned for your execution environment. For example, that's the hardware for your Java environment uh, and also for Python environment and so on. They will see the things which they probably have cost reductions uh, from the uh, hardware providers, which will be passed to us. So it becomes even cheaper. But there are also to the improvement areas from my personal perspective, only to mention Elastic File System. Yeah, it's currently enable, uh, available for, for the Lambda, but it's, it's not the match for S3. So S3 is natively integrated and uh, you, you can fire events if the new file is, is created on S3 or even updated. So you can call Lambda. It's not possible with Elastic File System. Sometimes you need all uh, those use cases. And also all, all compliance services like LWS config and so on, which are tightly integrated with S3, they are not integrated with Elastic File System. And you, because of compliance rules, you have to, to be aware what's happening if it's the regular requirements. CloudWatch improvements, a lot of improvements uh, have been done. Uh, currently, you have the language where you can search in the CloudWatch. You can even, um, you have now embedded metrics there you can send uh, your metrics asynchronously with uh, specific format CloudWatch, but in the area of observability and alarms, software as a service tool are really, yeah, they 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 they, they have they offer much more as CloudWatch. Um, it's not clear for me if the CloudWatch will try to close this gap because all these companies, Lumiga apps, are gone. They are working closely with LWS. So sometimes I see that. Um, LWS releases the services with the limited feature number and they don't improve uh, for having the room for all these uh, software as a service providers uh, to offer something. So that's uh, something which I can't predict. But uh, we also use pager duty for the alarms because we can do more and receive uh, uh, alarms for the whole system, for the serverless part, not serverless part, or even for not cloud part of our, yeah, of our solution. So we also use some of these tools because they provide value for us. Also, Elasticsearch, many people rely on, the, on them. And it's currently not serverless because we are managing family instances, the number of instances. We're also managing the storage. We have to increase the storage if we run out of storage. So it's really important service if you don't want only to rely on CloudWatch uh, for, for Elasticsearch is much powerful for, for searching. Um, and uh, it should become also more serverless. Other things, as I already told you, code commit, it's not nearly comparable to GitHub and Bitbucket, but has nice integrations with Lambda. So you can fire up events with code commit. It's Git as a service, um, manage service, Git as managed service. And yeah, you have the whole family of code commit, code deploy, code pipeline, and so on, but code commit, it's currently really limited. That's why many people use GitHub, Bitbucket, they have plugins to do code deploy, for example, because if you deploy into your cloud environment, you deploy cloud formation in the end and you need something like code deploy to be able to do this. Also, X-ray support for observability, it was released, but it didn't support uh, SQS, SNS. Now it's supporting the last thing that they support was um, AppSync. But Event Bridge as a new service, but it was also released one year ago. It's still not supported. And that's was what is needed because you, you would like to have the um, observability for all your serverless services. If one is missing, you have some kind of broken pipeline. You don't see what's happening. And another thing is, which I seen last time, that CloudFormation, SAM, SDK, as new services, they don't support new feature from day one. So, Event Bridge will be released, but it doesn't have support for cloud formation for several months. So you can't automate everything there. So you have to wait. And 
so you can only prototype things. It's probably okay for the first two months, but for me, it's, uh, it's the question. Uh, so the cloud formation should be supported from the day one. So these are the, the other improvement areas, especially in LWS. So yeah, to wrap up, uh, there are things you have to ask yourself in order to decide to go serverless or not, like application lifecycle, understand your workloads, platform limitations, also understand your cost at scale, what, what services do you use, what they add up to your bill, organizational knowledge, yeah, how to, what is your culture, how you can transform it, and so how people react and how you can embrace this, and also the platform and uh, tooling maturity in order to understand what's your tool to go and you have options um, probably with each cloud provider. I think that's it. That's also, you can contact me. You see, you can find me also on LinkedIn, on Twitter. I don't have my personal page. So if you have questions, don't hesitate uh, to write me. Um, yes, and probably we can now go to the questions. We have, thank you very much for listening. I don't currently know how many people there in the room, um, but I'm finished and I'm happy to answer your questions. All right. Thank you very much. So do, do we have questions? If so, please drop them in the chat. Maybe have you seen how many people attended the talk? About uh, 20 in the stream okay. and uh, three more in the room here. Okay. All right, it seems that there are no questions. Okay, and then uh, thank you very much. Okay. For, I will be happy to answer them by email or by other platforms. I will, I will send the presentation to the organizer so you, will, you can read this also later. <laughs>